Praise the Lord. You guys can be seated. Thank you, Deborah. If you don't know Deborah, she's in charge of our Timeless Treasure Ministries, right? Y'all can clap for her. Wow. Y'all never clap for me, but I, it doesn't hurt my feelings. It's okay. Hey, uh, I want to continue this uh, series that we started on Easter, uh, Hammer and Nails. And, uh, and it reminded me of a, of a, a story I want to tell you. I, when, when we were living in Florida, I was a youth pastor. And, uh, and Zachary was about, um, I don't know, he was probably three, four, five years old. He's not here today, so I can say whatever I want to say. Uh, he's, he's in divine today. And, uh, and so Zachary, believe it or not, every now and then would be a little strong-willed. Can y'all believe that at all? A little stubborn. I don't know where he gets that from. Uh, he can be a little bit stubborn. And so one day, he did something that he should not have done, and he misbehaved. And his mama began to, to tell him about it, you know, and have a, have a discussion. Y'all know what I'm saying. Have a discussion with, with this little boy. And uh, he, he, was, he was very cute. He was very deceiving because he was so cute. And he thought, how can somebody so cute do something so deceivious, you know? And, uh, but, the, but that's how he was. He, he was uh, rambunctious and, and just kind of did what he wanted to do. And he wanted to live life. He wanted to have fun. And so he's doing what he's doing. And he's not supposed to do it. And his mom begins to tell him. And, uh, and he looks at her and goes, no. And she said, yes. He said, no. Can y'all see Zach doing that, right? Today it wouldn't work. She... <laughs> and so uh, now we had a big coffee table. It was a strange coffee table, and it was uh, built, and it was a little higher than normal. And he was on one side, and she was on the other. And so he keeps disagreeing with her, and so she stands up. Now, you would think that would bring a little fear into him, but it didn't, right? And so she walks around. As she goes this way, he goes that way. And they keep going around, and it keeps going faster and faster and faster. And there they go around and around, and they're going, right? All around this coffee table. And every now and then she'd be quick. She'd stop like a linebacker, just turn back and go the other way. But he was like a wide receiver, and he was quick, and he'd go that way. And this kept on going. And, and, and he's, he's thinking. He's starting to smile about it now. He's enjoying life. He's like, she can't catch me. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, like a ninja warrior, my wife jumps on top of the coffee table it was like slow motion you know that that kung fu panda just like and then she hits that coffee table he didn't even move he, he, he knew that was it. His eyes were frozen, and she got him. And I can't tell you the rest of the story because, you know, we're a loving family and all. But uh, this, it kind of reminds me of that, the crucifixion. Because the devil was running around. He thought he had won. He thought he had evaded God. He thought that he was uh, not only was he going to have all the souls of everybody who doesn't believe in, in Christ, but also Christ himself. And then all of a sudden, Jesus hops up on the coffee table and comes back from the dead and everything changes. And, and this is really the, the mystery of the crucifixion because the enemy didn't understand it. And I want to continue this. And uh, you can follow in your notes. You can hit notes on your app. Or if you're new here, the little QR code in front of you, you can find the notes there. But here's, what, here's the, the essence of the message. God's mysterious wisdom is hidden from those without the Spirit. All right, so there is a mysterious wisdom. Everybody say mystery. It is a mysterious wisdom that not everybody knows. Let me read this to you out of 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 6. It says, We do, however, speak a message of wisdom among the mature, but not the wisdom of this age or the rulers of this age who are coming to... No, we declare God's wisdom a mystery that has been hidden and that God destined for our glory before time began. None of the rulers of this age understood it, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. That's how you know they didn't, they didn't understand what was happening. They didn't understand the mystery. And the apostle Paul saying, now we have the Holy Spirit. Now we understand the mystery. If they would have understood it then, they would not have crucified Christ. Let me go on in verse 9. It says, however, as it is written, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, what no human mind has conceived, the things God has prepared for those who love him. These are the things God has revealed to us by his spirit. 
And so you have this mystery. The devil didn't understand it. The rulers of the, of, of the day didn't understand it. Pontius Pilate didn't understand it. King Herod didn't understand it. The religious leaders, nobody understood it. Even Jesus' own disciples did not understand it. And, and what they did not understand is, is what we now can understand by the Holy Spirit. And when you understand it, it affects your life. It plays a role in your life. Understanding this mystery, and we have to receive it by the Holy Spirit, and when you understand the mystery, the Bible says that his plan for you will begin to happen. What no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, and what no mind can conceive. So no matter how good your life is, God has something better for you, but you have to understand the mystery. Everybody with me? Amen? Amen? All right, here, let me go to the next one. You know, now, what happens? I'm still just kind of reviewing from last week a little bit. God offers Christ to ransom us from death. Right? Everybody say ransom. Now, remember, if somebody kidnaps somebody and then you give them a ransom, they give you the victim back and you keep the ransom. And so when God says, I'm going to give Christ as a ransom, then what he is essentially saying is, I'm going to give my son, Jesus Christ, to the devil as a ransom so that all those who believe in me but sinned, and because they sinned, they couldn't go to heaven, but I'm going to give a ransom. I'm going to pay their debt with my own son so they can go to heaven. And, and so in, in the devil's mind, he's been watching this since the Old Testament where it was foreshadowed through the sacrifice of lambs. And they would go and they would offer a lamb that would pay the debt. It would be a ransom. But the lamb stayed dead. And so Satan has reason now. Christ, uh, God is going to give me Christ as a ransom. I get to keep him. He will stay dead. He will stay in the spirit of death. I will be over him. I will be his authority because I have authority over sin, death, and hell. God has given him that for the time being. So he's thinking, I get Jesus. I got to let everybody go, but I get the son of God. And, and we have to understand that, that he never, never, never understood that Jesus was going to rise from the dead. It was a shock. You should have seen my son's eyes. They were this big when my wife jumped on the coffee table. Now, what you don't know is I was just sitting over there watching it. It was like entertainment. I was like, let me get a video camera. And just No, I wasn't doing that. But <clears throat> it, it, was, it was shocking. It was shocking to the enemy when this happens. And so Satan reasons that God is giving him Christ and he doesn't understand that Christ is going to rise from the dead. He doesn't understand the mystery. Now, Satan is not content with the ransom exchange. He's not content. He's not happy with it. Satan is greedy. Everybody say greedy. So that's the thing about sin. Sin is never satisfied. When you sin, you are never satisfied. It begins to, to take over your life and you become addicted to something, whether you're addicted to, to uh, what we typically think of addictions or just addicted to fun, addicted to work, addicted to religion, whatever it is. But, but sin is never satisfied. So you're going after something. It's never enough. So here you have the devil and God says, I'm going to give you my son. And the devil said, that ain't enough. I need more than that. And he is greedy. And, and because he, he is not <clears throat> content, he goes after Christ because he knows if he can get the lamb of God to sin, then Jesus' death on the cross is not going to pay my debt. It's not going to pay the debt for anybody. That death on the cross will pay his debt because of his sin. So he's trying to get Jesus to sin. And if he can get Jesus to sin, he gets to keep Jesus and all of us. And everybody, he's greedy. Amen? And so how does he do this? Satan tempts Jesus to sin with overwhelming suffering. Everybody say suffering. And so when we talked about it last week and the, the excruciating pain in the crucifixion and how your body dies, you slowly drown in your own blood as it's just filling up in your lungs. But the, also the emotional pain of seeing the people that you have given your life to for three years and now they are all out there yelling, crucify him, crucify him. Your own disciples, Judas betrays you. Peter denies you even after you told him that it would happen. He still does it anyway. All the disciples are gone. All he's got left is his mama, because mamas are always going to be there. Can I get an amen from the mamas? Amen. And, 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 and the, the disciple that Jesus loved, John. And so that's it. Everybody else is left. So it's not just physical pain, physical suffering, but emotional, spiritual. In a little while, we see Jesus hanging on the cross, speaking to God the Father, saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So there is spiritual. There is the mental anguish. It was so much in the Garden of Gethsemane. So Satan 
is trying to tempt Jesus to sin with overwhelming suffering. The good news that we know today is that Jesus won the battle. He never sinned. The enemy came at him with everything he had, the full force of the spirit of death, trying to get him just for a moment to be selfish, just for a moment. He was trying to get Jesus to the place that, that it was too much. Have you ever felt like what you're going through is too much, that the suffering is too much, I can't handle anymore, there's been enough of this and this? If one more thing happens, and we say that, right? And he's trying to get Jesus in this place where, where he is saying, it is too much pain, it is too hard, these people don't even love me, they don't even care, they, they are taking me for granted. And, and the Bible says that he has the ability, so he is all God and all man at the same time. As a man, he's enduring all of this, and as God, he knows on the other side of the cross, there will be a, a resurrection, not only of his body, but of the body of every believer forever, amen? And so he has that knowledge. He's got to transfer that knowledge back to the man so that he can stay on the cross and Jesus wins the battle. Amen. That's the good news of the cross. So Satan is trying to tempt him with overwhelming suffering because Satan is greedy. He wants to keep all of us and Jesus himself. Amen. Now, the devil's ignorance of the mystery keeps him on the attack. He's always attacking. He still doesn't understand the mystery. He's still coming after the body of Christ. He's still going after you. Can I get an amen? If you've been attacked recently, you know what I'm saying. The, the enemy will never stop going after your mind, after your body, after your marriage, after your family, after your children, your grandchildren. There was always something happening trying to cause them to separate themselves from God. God will never leave us nor forsake us, but when we experience overwhelming suffering, we have a tendency to separate ourselves. Amen? And, and so what, what he didn't understand is he could have just received Christ as the ransom, but because he didn't, there was a battle on the cross, and so Jesus was able to face and defeat death. Amen? If the devil just would have been content, if he just would have said, that's enough, but because he wanted more and he wanted more than what happens, there's a battle on the cross, which gives Jesus the opportunity. It affords him the opportunity to face and defeat death. Amen. And so because he defeated death and now we live in him, then we have defeated death. We have power over the spirit of death. Amen. Turn to somebody and say, you have power. You have power by the Holy Spirit through Jesus Christ over death. Now, I'm not trying to say that you don't have to go to the hospital. I'm not trying to say you don't have to go get some medicine when you need it. I'm not even trying to say you're going to live forever. All right? What I'm saying is the spirit of death, everything that the enemy does to you to, tries to kill your joy, your peace, your love, your mercy, your compassion, everything good in this life that cannot be measured by science, everything that is good in the spirit, the enemy is constantly trying to expose you to extreme suffering. So that you separate from God. He's trying to get you to tempt, but you have power over God. Amen? And so that's the mystery. Amen? Everybody say amen if you understand it. So what that means is every time the enemy comes against you, you should be getting stronger. You should be getting stronger. Every battle you face, every time the enemy does, you, you ought to say, devil, bring it on. Because every time you come, I'll walk away stronger. Amen? Through every valley, every time. Now let's go a little bit deeper today in Romans chapter 6, verse 8. It says, now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. Amen. Look at that phrase. It says, death no longer has mastery over Jesus. What does that mean? That means it did for a little while. For a little while, the spirit of death had mastery over Christ. Christ became my sin, and the wages of sin is death. He became your sin. He became the curse, right? He became the curse of sin. And so in that moment, he had to take the punishment of sin, which is death. And so death, the spirit of death, had mastery over him. But what this is telling us here is that Christ did not sin, and because he did not sin, death cannot legally have mastery over him because death only has mastery over those who have sinned. And so Christ died for my sin, but he never sinned. So he is no longer in submission to the spirit of death. Death took him, but death couldn't keep him. Amen. 
Amen. The devil said, Woo, I got this. Just like Zach thought, Ooh, I can run around forever. She'll get tired. The devil never knew that Jesus was going to rise from the dead. Amen. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14. It says, since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity so that by his death, he might break the power of him who holds the power of death. Let me read that again. So since the children have flesh and blood, that's you and me, he, Christ, too shared in their humanity so that by his death, he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. Amen? And so what it's saying is by his death, because he did not sin, he won the power over death. Amen? And so he breaks the power of sin and death. Now here's what the law says, the law of sin and death. If you sin, then death has the power to do whatever it wants to you until it finally takes your body and your soul. Amen? You understand? That's the law. That's the Old Testament law. If you sin, and we have all sinned, then death, the devil, had the authority, the power to come at you full force until he has destroyed your body and your soul. Until he has destroyed everything. That was the power he had. When Jesus died on the cross and defeated death, the Bible says he took back the keys of hell. He took back the keys of death. He took back the keys of sin. So now we don't live under the law, but we live in the spirit under grace. So now we sin, but death cannot come at us because death no longer has mastery over Christ and we are alive in Christ. Amen. And so you think about all the suffering you go through, all the attacks, everything the enemy does, it is nothing compared to what it could be because Jesus died on the cross. Amen? Now let's go a little bit deeper. What is the power of death? What is it? Where, where does death get its power? Let me read this again in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14. It says, since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity so that by his death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is the devil. And then verse 15, here's what I want you to see. And free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. Everybody say fear. Your fear of death. Not fear that your body's going to die, but, but fear of this separation from God. What, what is death? It is, it is being completely and totally separated from God. That's what hell is. It is the total absence of God. Nothing good. Everything wicked. Everything painful. It is the epitome of the worst of the worst of everything you can imagine. And then so, it, hell is called a lake of fire. And, and so it's telling us there in human terms what, what John the Revelator saw in a spiritual way that hell is like an eternal sense of drowning and burning forever. No, I don't want to go there. Amen. And so what does it say? It says the power of death, the power of death is our fear of suffering. Amen. Now, what it's saying is we have been held in slavery by a fear of death. It doesn't mean that I walk around afraid I'm going to die. If that were the truth, some of us wouldn't do what we do. Can I get an amen? We wouldn't be driving as fast as we drive. We wouldn't be driving as crazy as we drive. Amen. I should do a sermon on how you drive, right? It'd be a little too self-convicting, though, probably. <laughs> and, and so, but what is it talking about? Death is the separation of God. Now, here's the reality. God promises he will never leave you nor forsake you. God promises that he will be with you forever. And so the enemy cannot separate you from God. What the enemy can do is make it feel like you've been separated from God. And that's what suffering is. Suffering is this, this feeling that God is far from me. It is a feeling that there is distance between me and God. Amen? Here's how I wrote it. Suffering causes a sensation of distance from God. When Jesus is hanging on the cross, he has experienced this. It is a sensation. If you've ever been through the valley of the shadow of death, it, it feels dark. It feels hard. People betray you. They turn on you. You go through all kinds of mess, all kinds of tragedies, whether they are natural, whether they are man-made, whatever it is. People turn on you. The storms come up. People die. People get, I mean, all kinds of stuff. And when you're doing that, you, you can be in the middle of that saying, where is God in this? Where is he? And here's, here's the problem that we have done. The, the sinful nature, 
The way we are born, because we've inherited the sinful nature from Adam, has, has a, an inclination and a proclivity to crave comfort. Everybody say comfort. Ease. Everybody say ease. And pleasure. Everybody say pleasure. Comfort, ease, and pleasure. That's what we want as human beings all the time. Amen? That's why when you go to the grocery store and the person in front of you is supposed to be a 15 items or less and they have 47. You're not praying for them, are you? Right? We want things to be easy, to be comfortable, to be pleasurable. And so because that's our natural inclination, then when we suffer, it feels bad. And so what we have done in our, in our sinful human nature is we have defined what is good and what is bad. And we have said this is good and that's bad. If it's comfortable, it's good. If it's uncomfortable, it's bad. If it's pleasurable, it's good. If it hurts, it's bad. If it's easy, it's good. If it's difficult, it's bad. If I get a new job, that's good. If I get fired, that's bad. If, if, if I have a, a baby, that's good. If I lose a baby, that's bad. And we have defined it this way. So then when we suffer in our mind, this is bad. And if it's bad and we lose a sense of goodness in our life and we associate that with God, so then it feels like we are distant from God. There's so many bad things in my life. Where's God? I've been praying. I've been asking, where is God? I have a funeral coming up next week and uh, speaking to some of the family about other members of the family who are not believers. And, and, and the thing, uh, I said, what, what do you think the family needs to hear? And they, they said, well, what they keep asking is, how could God do this? In other words, where is God that this person died? Where is God that this young person, 30-something years old, how, where is God that, that God allowed them to die? And that's what we do. And we, we get that in our mind, and good and bad. But here's what the Bible says. Remember, the truth is what sets us free. And so the truth is the word of God. And the truth says all things are being worked together for good for those who are in Christ Jesus. Amen? And, and so the Bible says that I have to reframe everything, and I need to consider it pure joy. When I go through trials, how can I consider it pure joy? It doesn't mean that, that, you know, you get pulled over by the cop and he's giving you a ticket like, woo, thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Right? That's not what it means. But I'm reframing it in my mind saying God is going to do something good out of this. It may feel like Friday, but Sunday's coming. Amen. And, and so it's learn how to do it. So if God is working good in all things, then what's bad? What's bad? The only thing that's bad is when I let go of God when it feels bad. That's all that's bad. See, God is in the tension. He's in the tension. God, God is, uh, uh, he, we want to say God is all good, but God is good in the definition of what good is in the Bible. What we do is we think, well, if something feels good, if something is easy, if something is comfortable, if it's good, I need more of it. I need all I can get. Amen? Right? You find, you find something you like and you just want to do it all the time. Right? I, I found Bluebell. Yes, sir. Just give me all you got. Right? And we want whatever is good, whatever feels good. We just want. The problem is if you get only what is good as much as you want without limits, then what is good becomes bad. And this is the tension. You think about freedom. We live in a free country. Praise God. Right? We don't live somewhere that, that you have to worry about you're going to die on your way to church because you're going to church. We, we live in a free country. But freedom, if that's all you get, if you get as much freedom as possible without any limits, you get anarchy. And then anarchy needs tyranny to tamp it down. And so freedom eventually becomes tyranny if you get too much freedom. And so what, what God has said is, you're free, but not everything's beneficial. God says, you're free to do whatever you want as long as it's not sinful. But even some things that are not sinful are not beneficial, so he puts a limit on it. God is in the tension. He, he says, be perfect. Amen? Everybody say, be perfect. Right? He says, be perfect. So there's pressure. I got to be perfect. I got to do it right. I got to obey. But then he says, there is no condemnation when you don't. And so there's this tension between perfection and grace. 
And I'm trying to uh, grow in my, my understanding of God. I'm trying to grow in my obedience. But if I fail, I have grace and there's tension. If all you have is be perfect, be perfect, be perfect, that's when you have uh, Christians who are condemning, they are judgmental, they're constantly telling you how bad you are and how messed up you are and how you're going to hell and all. If that's all you got is that, then you become judgmental. On the other side, if all you have is grace without any perfection, then you have no morality. Because you think, well, I'll just do whatever I want to do, and Jesus loves me anyway, and, and he does, but you're messing up your life. And so everything is in this tension. You look at the earth. The, God made, made the earth, and what was the earth doing? doing? It was growing. It was feeding itself. You had rain and, and photosynthesis and all that stuff I don't understand, and grass was growing, trees are growing, everything is growing. So then what does God do? He makes the animals, and what do they do? They start to destroy the earth. They start eating what was growing. They start defecating on what is growing. And so you have this tension of good and bad. We would say growing is good, destroying is bad. But in, in the natural cycle of nature, you have growth and then you, you will have the death of plants that dry out. Then you have fires that will clean out brush. The earth is in this constant tension of good and bad. And, and when God made the heavens and the earth and he put the animal, he says, and it was good. Amen. And then he made man. Remember man, Adam walking around by himself saying, I need somebody, right? He's walking around and God said, this is not good. And so God makes a woman. The word woman in Hebrew means the opposite one against you. Does that feel like your marriage is the opposite one against you, right? <laughs> if you're amen to that, I'm sorry. <laughs> Whew. So what, what, now that doesn't mean that you're supposed to fight, but what it means is that the way your design works against it, it creates friction. And because my wife thinks a different way than I think, and she acts a different way than I think, and we drive each other a little bit nuts every now and then. Can I get an amen from my wife? Oh, she's not here. Okay. So, uh, but what happens is she becomes my limit. She says, well, you're doing this, but you need to look at how you're doing this. You're parenting, but you need to look at how you're parenting. And I'm her limit, and so she's doing things, and we speak truth to one another. So the idea of love is not, the world right now is trying to define love as all good, all pleasurable, all comfortable, all easy, all the time. But the word love in the scripture is both, I want to favor you, and I want to do things that are pleasurable, are easy, and are comfortable. At the same time, I will speak truth to you, and I will hurt you with the words because it's good for you. God is in the tension. If God is in the tension, then what's bad? The only thing that's bad is when you have only good or only bad. The Bible says, beware if you don't have any enemies. That is a strange thing to me. That means you're living to please everybody, trying to make everybody happy all the time. And in, the, in doing so, you're actually losing your own identity. The Bible says that, that the, 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 the truth from a friend is better than a kiss from an enemy. And so God is in the tension. And so when everything is bad, if I understand God is in the tension, then there's still good in there somewhere. And if I can find the good and if I can consider it pure joy, then what can the enemy do to me? Amen? What can the enemy do? Just because it hurts, it doesn't mean it's bad. Just because it feels bad doesn't mean it's bad. Just because there's pain, it doesn't mean God has left you. Amen? Nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. And so no matter how it feels, God is still there. No matter how bad it hurts, God is still there. No matter how long you think it's going to last, God is still there. And if you begin to understand God is in the tension, so even when it feels bad, God is still there, then you can praise him in the dark. You can praise him when everything is bad. Everything's falling apart and you can still, you can be like Job and Job is going through hell on earth and he says, nevertheless, yet I will praise him. Amen. And you have this ability that in your pain, you can hold on to God. And when you hold on to God, you defeat death over and over and over again. Amen. Psalm 37, 23. Let me read this. It says, the Lord makes firm the steps of the one who delights in him, though he may stumble. He will not fall for the Lord upholds him with his hand. I was young and now I'm old. Yet I have never seen the righteous forsaken. 
That just makes you want to say, praise God, right? This is what David's writing. And look at verse 25. I was young, and now I'm old, and I have never seen the righteous forsaken. But he lived before Jesus. And he would later write, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, what... The whole idea of Christ on the cross, and he says this, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It is a theological conundrum because people say, did, did God really uh, forsake Jesus? Because Jesus is God, so is that even possible? I don't have an answer for that. That's above my pay grade. That's, that's a mystery of the Trinity. But I can tell you, as a man, Jesus living as a man, he felt like God abandoned him. The enemy came at him. Remember, the enemy before the crucifixion had all authority over death. And he came at Christ with the full force and power of the spirit of death. And because he did, and Jesus won the battle, Jesus now has authority over death. So now the devil gets to decide how far. I mean, Jesus now gets to decide how far the devil can go. Amen? Jesus determines death's level of attack. Death has no power over you and I. So no, so one thing, two things have happened here. One, Jesus has limited how much the devil can do to you. We, we wonder, I, I can't imagine there could be any more. Trust me, there could be a whole lot more. But because of the grace of God and the victory on the cross, God has subdued the devil so he can only do so much. And then he has given you the spirit to resist. The Bible says if you resist the devil, he must flee. He doesn't have a choice. He's got to go. It's written down in law. God says to the devil, if they resist, you can try for a little while. But if they keep resisting, you got to go. And this is the power we have. And then every time the full force uh, that, that the devil is allowed to bring against me, whatever that is, every time I win, every time I resist him, to, he is going to come at me with, with suffering. Never to the point of Christ. Because Christ is in control now. But to whatever degree he comes against me, every time I win, then I've won that battle. Now the enemy's got to go back to God and say, well, can I do a little more? And he's got to go and beg, and God will say no, or he'll say yes. I love it that it says that Jesus has the keys of the kingdom, because Christ is the second person of the Trinity. He is the one who became flesh. He lived this life so he could understand what it's like for you and I. And he is our compassionate high priest, amen? And so the one who decides how far the devil can go has walked in your shoes. The one who decides how far the devil can go has been in your situation, and he knows how much you can handle. And so when the devil goes back and says, how far can I go? He will limit it based on where you're at because the Bible says God does not break a bruised reed. In other words, if you're already in the valley, God's not going to let the devil just keep heaping it on. So what we have to understand is it may feel that way, but we have to know this truth that no matter how bad it feels, it is limited and we have power and God has given us only what we can get through by holding on to the Holy Spirit. The Bible says he will get, never give us more than we can handle. Amen? You heard that before? Okay. It says without an escape. He'll never give us more than we can handle without an escape. Everybody say without an escape. Next time you say that out loud, make sure you say that part, without an escape. Because the escape is the Holy Spirit. God will give you, he, he will let the devil come at you so often with more than what you can handle on your own. But he gives you the Holy Spirit so that you can have victory over whatever happens. Amen? So now, when you understand what's happening at the crucifixion and how the enemy still doesn't understand this, he's going to keep attacking. He's going to keep coming at you. He's got to ask for permission. It is going to be subdued. It can never be as much as he wants. And God is going to protect you based on where you're at in that moment. And so in all of that, you can consider every piece of painful moment of your life as good. And you can still praise him. And you don't have to be afraid. Amen? Let me read this to you. John 16, 33, and I'm almost done. Jesus said this. He said, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. But take heart, for I have overcome the world. Amen? This is the key. If I understand the mystery, then when pain comes, I will take heart. If I understand the mystery, then I will encourage myself. 
If I understand the mystery, I will not go into depression. I will not go into anger. I will not try to alleviate the pain quickly with drugs or alcohol or whatever. I will hold on to Jesus because I know that even though it feels bad, it's not bad because God is in the tension. And if I'm in the valley now, he's going to lead me on to the green pastures. Amen. We, we love Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. He leads me beside quiet waters and guides me to green pastures. And, and we love that. We're like, yes, that's the life I want. Just serenity. Right? Reminds me of that Seinfeld episode. Serenity now. Right? Uh, so s- serenity. I just want peace and joy and happiness all the time. But between, but if, if, if sheep stay at one pasture the whole time, they'll destroy it. And so the good has to have a limit. The limit is the shepherd's got to take them to another pasture. And what's between this pasture and that pasture? The valley of the shadow of death. But God is in the tension. You're still following the shepherd even in the valley. Amen? And so fearlessness in suffering releases power over death. Amen? Another version of this, it translates, it doesn't say take heart, it says be of good cheer. When you were in pain, and maybe you're in pain today, maybe the suffering's too much right now today, be of good cheer. Don't get depressed. Don't get sad. Don't give up. Understand the mystery, and you will sense God giving you courage and fearlessness. So even in the pain, you will praise him. And that releases power from God, and you overcome death again and again and again. Amen? Stand up and let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you. We thank you for the power you have released in us. And Lord, as we sing this song, just let us, let this be a prayer song. So that Lord, even in our suffering, even wherever we're at, whatever may be happening today, Lord, that we would recognize there is power being released into our body, into our mind, our spirit, into our marriage, into our relationship with our kids. There is power being released in every place. So help us, God, to be fearless, fearless to not let fear take hold, to not give the devil a foothold, but to understand that you are in the tension. And what feels bad is not really bad as long as we hold on to you and let your power be released in Jesus' name. Let's sing this.